So hi guys, this is Filip Tvrdi again. Welcome uh, to the first lecture um, on philosophy of language that is going to be online. And I will talk about theory of reference. I'm going to start today talking about Plato, who lived in ancient Greece in the 5th and 4th century uh, before coming to era. He was, of course, an ancient Greek philosopher, and you probably know that he was a student of Socrates and the teacher of Aristotle. He was also the founder of the Academy in Athens, that was the first institution of higher learning in the West. And he was uh, the author of more than 30 dialogues. In every dialogue, Socrates is the main speaker and the main hero of the discussion because in the end he always wins. I think that it's important to understand that his most important um, idea about philosophy of language is that he was the creator of the theory of forms. This theory explains two important things. The first one is how people acquire knowledge and the second one is how we use language and this is why theory of forms is important for us today. According to this so-called theory of forms or we can also call it theory of ideas sometimes the reality is divided into two large and independent realms. The first one is the material world of objects and the second is immaterial world of forms or ideas as i said before i can illustrate it with this cute picture there are a lot of cats in the material world of objects but there's just one form of cat or catness there is just one idea of cat in this uh, material world of forms Plato invented and described. According to Plato, a human soul is a part of the world of forms. It resides there before birth and it returns there again after our deaths. It has two important results. The first one is that when we get in contact with objects of the material world, we remember somehow the ideal forms that are their prototypes. It means that when I see one cat and the second cat and the third cat, I somehow intuitively understand that they have prototype in the immaterial world of forms, and it is this idea of catness. And the second important thing is that this is how language works, because according to Plato, when we use words, we understand each other only because our words refer to their ideal counterparts in the realm of forms. Which means that when I say a word cat, you understand it because you can imagine that immaterial object, that immaterial form, uh, and you are acquainted with this form before you were born. It sounds quite counterintuitive, but I'm going to show you later on that it's intuitive for some of us too. We can sketch some kind of triangle of reference according to Plato. Reference is this relation between words and their objects. This is what reference is. And according to Plato, we might use a triangle to understand how a language works. Because according to Plato, every word, of course, uh, has its object. That's that material thing you see or hear or touch or taste or smell with our common senses. But it also has a form in a, a material world of ideas. And this is the reason why we can understand that all these physical objects are in some kind of mystical relation with this form in the immaterial world of ideas. So when I say about a cat, it of course has a reference in the material world. It is its object, that material cat you can see or touch. 
but it also has an, a material form in the world of ideas. And this is a universal thing that every material object of the same kind shares. By the way, I will show you a lot of triangles today because I think that philosophers who deal with language and understanding, they are somehow obsessed with triangles. I'm going to show you at least three of them today. A few seconds ago, I said that Plato's theory of reference, his understanding of language, is a bit counterintuitive. It might be bizarre, but I also think that it might be intuitive for some of you, because some of you, even when you don't know that, are Platonists uh, about language. Let me ask you some questions and please give them a thought, at least for a while. What about abstract words? What do they refer to? I think this is an important question, because when we talk about cats and stuff like that, this material, we can understand that the reference might be a material object in a material world. But what about more abstract words like, for example, pride or love or a number? What do these terms refer to? They don't have anything real in the material world, so how it's possible that we understand them? What about numbers? Do they exist somehow? When I say, for example, five, it can denote all five apples and five pears and five friends and five cats in the world. But here we have this intuitive feeling that numbers are something more than a set of all things of the same number. So the question is, do they exist somehow, for example, in this immaterial world of forms or ideas? As you can see, when you think about numbers and about mathematics, you usually have this very strong feeling that Platonism is somehow right. And the other question is, do meanings of word exist? How? Where? We have different words for the same objects in different languages. So, for example, I can call a cat, a cat in English, kočka in a Czech, katze in a German, but we have this intuitive feeling again that all these words in different languages mean the same. So where is their meaning? Is it again somewhere out there in that immaterial world of forms? And another question is, how do we get access to these Platonic forms? Do we just feel them somehow? Or can we approach them in an intuitive way? This is a heavy question for all those Platonists. And another question of the same kind, how do mathematics and geometry work? Mm, my favorite question is, if there were no people in the world, would the Pythagorean theorem hold true? And if there were no people in the world, would language exist? I think that we are quite sure that if there were no people in the world who speak Czech, and if there were no texts in the world in Czech, we would probably say that the language doesn't exist. But if there were no people in the world, and if there were no texts on mathematics, we would still somehow intuitively think that Pythagorean theorem exists, that it is still true even without people. So these are quite heavy philosophical questions, and these are also problems for this Platonic understanding of language. So let's move on. The Platonic account of language has its problems, as you could see in my last slide, and philosophers in the 19th and 20th and the 21st century they tried or have tried to improve this account. One of them was Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, who lived in the end of the 19th and in the beginning of the 20th century. You can see his picture uh, in the presentation. He was an American mathematician, logician and philosopher of language too. His academic career 
is somehow sad because he never published a book during his lifetime. After his death, eight volumes of collected papers were published, and this is one of the most important source of linguistic thought in the 20th century. But he had a quite large influence on his followers. He is the founder of pragmatism. In 1878, he got the lecture called How to Make Our Ideas Clear, and we can say that this is the moment when pragmatism was born. Sanders Peirce is also the inventor of semiotics, which is a theory of science. Please remember the difference between semiotics and semantics. Semiotics is about science and semantics is about its or their meaning, as I explained in my first lecture. So let me tell you a few things about pragmatism that Peirce founded. Pragmatism is the first important philosophical movement from the United States. American philosophy in the 19th century was non-existent, I would say. It, was, um, it wasn't very original. It was heavily influenced by German philosopher uh, Hegel. But around 1870, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, pragmatism began. I told you that legendary date, 1878, when Peirce had his famous lecture on how to make our ideas clear. But pragmatism was popular among many other thinkers, and the key thinkers are not only Peirce, but also William James and John Dewey. You can see James's very influential book, Pragmatism and Other Writings, uh, on this slide. Let me explain the term pragmatism. It comes from a Greek term, pragma, which is, I would say, completely synonymous with another Greek term, praxis, which means that pragmatism is a practically oriented philosophy. It stands against all kinds of speculative thinking. It doesn't like metaphysics and some, kind, some speculative forms of religion. Pragmatists they want it to be useful for our everyday lives. And I think that they were quite successful in that, as you can see in their philosophy of language. Two most important ideas of pragmatism are pragmatic theory of truth and pragmatic theory of meaning. I'm going to talk about pragmatic theory of, me of meaning a lot. Usually it is understood as a theory that context is important for our understanding of words. But let me tell you one sentence about truth in pragmatism. According to pragmatists, a truth is something like utility. It means that mm, useful ideas are usually true too. Useful sentences are true again. Uh, but I um, don't want to get into much detail. Um, let me talk about Peirce's theory of reference again. As I explained, Peirce is a father of semiotics, a theory of science. And according to Peirce, semiotics is the most important um, and most central science of all because human understanding is dependent on science. When you deal with biology or mathematics or physics or anthropology, you use science. You cannot deal without them, which means, according to Peirce, that semiotics is the most important science of them all. Peirce invented a quite banal definition of science. According to him, a sign is something that stands for something to someone in some capacity. As you can see, this is a very vague definition, and Peirce understood that it is vague. He thought that it must be vague because signs are everywhere around us, so we cannot be more specific 
when we try to define them. We can say that uh, Peirce's theory of science is triadic, as Platonic theory was, which means that every sign, according to Peirce, has three parts, and these are a representament, object, and interpretant. A representament is a material vehicle for a sign. Object is a material or abstract entity that is denoted by the sign. Uh, it is an entity a sign refers to. And interpretant is a meaning in the mind of an addressee. It's a meaning in the mind of usually a human being, because sign is a sign only in cases when someone understands them. So, if I talk about my favorite example, cats, the word a cat is a representament, a material cat that exists in a material world is an object of it, but there is also some idea of cat in your mind, and it is that interpretant uh, part of uh, the sign cat. Um, just for comparison, in uh, Europe, um, Swiss semiologist Ferdinand de Saussure was probably more famous than Peirce in the beginning of the 20th century. You've probably heard about de Saussure. He was inventor of semiology. I would say that the meaning of semiology is almost the same as the meaning of semiotics. It is a theory of signs. The interesting thing is that de Saussure also didn't write any book during his lifetime. His very important um, course, The Linguistic General, was published in 1916, a few years after his death, by, and it was published by his students. Uh, when I said that Peirce's theory of science is triadic, which means that every sign is um, based on three parts, the Saussure's theory of science is dyadic, because according to the Saussure, every sign has just two important parts. They are called signifier and signified. In French, it's signifiant and signifié. I'm very sorry about my French, it is really non-existent. Uh, and the difference might be of interest, because signifier is a material sign in a certain language. I would say that it's almost the same as a representament in a person's account. But this signified is just a mental image that is associated with the sign. And this is not very clear if it's a mental image in one's speaker's hat or in mm, abstract understanding of all uh, linguistic community, but you can clearly see that there is something missing in the Saussure's account, and it is object, uh, something that first called an object, which is a material or abstract entity that is denoted. According to the Saussure, objects are not of any importance for a linguistic research. So uh, I promised you a lot of triangles today. This is a triangle of reference according to Peirce. You can see that the main idea behind that is almost platonic because every sign has its representament, which is material sign. It also has a material object that is called object. And there is something ideal in this diagram and it is a interpretant, which is somehow close to platonic forms or ideas in the realm of forms or in the realm of ideas. Uh, just to compare it to um, the Saussure's account, you can, say, you can see that it's a bit simplified because it is only two parts, as I explained. 
The first one is a material sign signifier, and the second one is that's something that is denoted that the sign refers to and is called a signified in um, the Saussure's theory. Uh, the first part of this lecture was some kind of prologue to the philosophy of language in the 20th century. I promised that I'm going to talk only about analytic philosophy and Peirce and the Saussure and Plato are of course not analytic philosophers. Plato lived in ancient Greece, uh, Peirce was a pragmatist and the Saussure is inventor of uh, linguistic structuralism. So the main part of my lecture starts right now because I think that the most important for the analytic philosophy of the 20th century is a German philosopher, mathematician and logician called Gottlob Frege. He was born in 1848 and died in 1925 and his life was also quite sad because he was very academically unsuccessful at University of Vienna. He lived in Vienna for his whole life. This was the smallest university in Germany in the 19th century and he wasn't very popular. The thing is that he didn't have any students. Uh, his lectures were very unpopular. He was unknown and misunderstood during his lifetime. His books were not read and when someone wrote a review on them, he or she usually didn't read them too. But Frege was later in his life appreciated by two very important figures uh, in the analytic philosophy of the 20th century. And this was British philosopher Bertrand Russell and his Austrian friend Ludwig Wittgenstein. We can say that Frege's influence on the philosophy of the 20th century is very, very huge because he was the father of two very important academic sciences. The first one is modern semantics and the second, we might say that he was the father of modern logic. I'm going to talk about his semantics a lot because he invented quite original theory of meaning in 1892 he wrote a short paper on the subject called Iber, Sinn und Bedeutung, which means on sense and reference. By the way, this key text was published in English after World War II. I believe it was in 1949, I guess. Uh, but Frege also might be considered uh, the father of modern logic because he invented very original symbolic notation. So it means that he is the father of modern formal logic that uses symbols. In 1879, Frege wrote a book on the topic. Uh, this is called Begriffsschrift. It means something like mm, symbolic alphabet, something like that, symbolic letters. And we still use uh, Frege's symbolic notation. It was improved by many others, for example, George Boole or Italian logician Giuseppe Perno or again Bertrand Russell and many others. I will give you a very um, short introduction about modern logic in the end of this lecture. The interesting thing is that Frege's research in logic and semantics started with quite simple question. Frege started to question identity. He was interested in what the term is identical really means. Frege understood that there are two kinds of identity. The first one is trivial. It is, for example, A is A. There's nothing interesting about that. But when you say A is B, A is identical with B, it might be of importance, it might be of interest, it's significant, it's not trivial, because when you hear that or see it or read it, you get some new piece of information that A is identical with B, of course. So, for example, when you hear Mark Twain is Mark Twain, 
It is, again, quite trivial. You don't have to think about that. It's truism. It's very banal. But when you hear that Mark Twain was Samuel Clemens, that Samuel Clemens was Mark Twain's real name, uh, it's significant. You find something new. And there are many other examples about that. For example, uh, the sentence, the author of Iliad is identical with the author of Odyssey. This is again quite significant. You probably know that uh, the author of both of these um, epic poems was Greek uh, author uh, Homer. But if you say this to a small child in grammar school, for example, he or she will get a new piece of information again. So it might be important to understand that Homer was author of both of these mm, fundamental books. Frege's example comes from astronomy. He wrote a lot about the identity of evening star and morning star. I hope you understand those terms. Mm, evening star is the brightest star you can see in the evening and the morning star is the brightest star in the sky in the morning. Mm. People in ancient times and in the Middle Ages thought that these were two mm, different mm, objects, but we now understand that these stars are not stars at all, because even in star and morning star are both Venus, the planet Venus which again, might be significant. It's not a simple trivial identity between two same objects. This is some kind of identity that it's interesting to talk about. And the last example of Frege is the identity of numbers. When you say that six is identical to six, you don't, you know, it's not very interesting at all. But when you understand that two plus four is equal to 3 plus 3, it might be quite mm, fascinating if you haven't heard about this one before. So mm, Frege questioned identity and in the end he questioned mainly numbers. He was interested in the question how it's possible that numbers are identical, how it's possible that different mathematical phrases might be equal, how it's possible that the meaning of different mathematical or linguistic phrases is identical. And this was the beginning of Frege's theory of meaning that is called semantics today. According to Frege, every proper name has two aspects. And by the way, Frege thought that proper names are just names of objects. Proper name is everything that has a meaning. And meaning was that something that Frege was interested in. So, according to Frege, every proper name has two aspects. The first aspect is called reference. In German, it's called Bedeutung. And the second aspect of every term is sense. And in German, this aspect is called Sinn. Reference is what names refer to. These are those usually material objects to which terms refer. For example, the reference of the proper name evening star is the planet Venus. Well, uh, the second aspect is sense, and it is what name expresses. It is the way that the term refers to the object, the way it refers, because we can have many ways uh, to express the same thing, the same object. So according to Frege, we have many mm, names that have many senses. For example, evening star, morning star, and Venus, these are different senses, and they all have the same reference, which is again, the planet Venus. According to Frege, 
the difference between reference and sense is very important in other sciences and in other parts of human life. When you deal with natural sciences or any other hard sciences, you do not have any interest in sense. Reference is all what matters. So, for example, when you say in zoology, equus ferus cabalus, every colleague of you understands that you talk about horses. This term, this proper name, equus ferus cabalus, has a very clear and um, non-problematic reference. It's what we call in our natural languages a horse. But when we deal with poetry, there is something we can call a primacy of sense, because, we, because you can have a many ways how to express the same thing, how to name the same object, the same reference. Because when I talk about equus ferus cabalus, I can use many, many different senses, like horse, a mount, a cop, a foal, a yearling, a coat, a stallion, and so on and so on. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of ways how to denote the same horse. There are many ways how to talk about the same stuff. Well, and Frege was interested in the relation between reference and sense, as you can see in the next diagram. I promised you a lot of triangles, and this is the third and the last one. This is a triangle of reference according to Frege. We have signs. Uh, let's say we have signs for proper names. For example, I don't know, morning star. And every sign has two aspects that are called, as I said, sense and reference. Reference is a usually material object that exists in a material world. And sense is a way how to express the meaning, its reference. Mm, many, there might be, as I said, many senses for the same reference, and every sign has both all the time. This is a table just for your you know, understanding. If you read a text on philosophy of language or linguistics, you can meet many terms that mean the same. Because when Frege talked in German about Sinn und Bedeutung, we, as I said, talk about sense and reference in English usually, but there are many other terms like intention and extension. These are completely synonymous as, uh, with uh, sense and reference. Or you can talk about connotation and denotation. This is one of few examples of me using Czech during these lectures. In Czech we usually use terms smysl and Wiesnam for sense and reference. I'd be very happy if you read uh, just a sample of Frege's paradigmatical essay, Sense and Reference, from 1892. I gave you just a sample of four pages. I put it uh, in Moodle. And I have five questions for you to think about. You can read them here. I will not go through them. We can discuss them uh, through those online sessions on Wednesday's mornings. And now a few words on symbolic logic. Please do not be afraid. This is not going to be in the test. I just want you to have some, you know, quite faint idea about symbolic logic that Frege invented. Uh, you can see that in logic today we use many different symbols for variables and connectives. Uh, connectives are important because we usually use five of them. You can see a symbol for negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, and biconditional. These uh, connectives have their counterparts in a natural language because they mean not, and, or, if then, and if and only if. Uh, let me uh, show you uh, another slide on symbolic logic. This one the situation gets here a bit more complicated because you can see quantifiers that mean for all and there exists. The first quantifier is called universal 
and the second one is called existential quantifier is just the first letter the first symbol it's inverted a or inverted e and there's also some modal quantifiers in contemporary logic that mean necessity and possibility that square p means that it is necessary that p and that diamond p means it is possible that p and there's also some other apparatus in symbolic logic like parentheses and bracket and braces and other things i don't want to uh, get into much detail i don't think it's important for you i just want to show you a sample of how symbolic logic works today when we use logical analysis we try to explain natural language in two kinds of calculuses the first one is called propositional the second one is called predicate calculus the propositional calculus is interested in whole sentences only in whole propositions predicate calculus is a bit deeper because it is interested in parts of sentences in parts of prepositions like mm, subject and verb and predicate and so on and so on and stuff like that so uh, let me give you some examples of logical laws we have for example a law of, of contradiction which we can read uh, it is not true that p and non p and negation of p the other uh, law is law of excluded middle which we might read in natural language p or non p principle of identity means that p is identical with p if p then p again and there's also a law of double negation which we can read p implies non non p p implies that it is not true that is not true that p and i can i can also give you some samples of predicate calculus for example i can take this sentence from a natural language all swans are white and I can transcribe it in the language of symbolic logic. I could read this uh, form, uh, this formula. Um, all for L exists. It is true that they are swans and white. Another sentence from uh, natural language might be: Some pigs can fly. And there is a formula: There exists at least one X for which is true there is a pig and it can fly or another famous sentence no man is an island i can transcribe it into formal logic in this way it is not true that there is an x for which is true that it is man and an island too My point is that this logical analysis is not very different from syntactic analysis. And this is the reason why I think that logic might be of importance for linguists too today. Because when you deal with syntactic analysis, you do almost the same thing that logicians do in logic. You take a sentence from a natural language, for example, I hit a monkey with an umbrella and you create this syntactic tree for your analysis it means that there are some phrases in your sentence uh, this is a kind of analysis noam chomsky does in his research and you can see that there is a difference between this analysis and this one because i can have two sentences i hit a monkey with an umbrella and i hit a monkey with an umbrella the same sentence can mean two completely different things and you have to use syntactic analysis or maybe a logical analysis to understand the difference. My point is that you should be interested in formal logic at least a bit because you should understand that what you do in syntax and linguistics more generally has almost the same aim as well as what logicians do in a symbolic logic in the 20th century and later on. So that's all, uh, that's all for today. Uh, thank you for your patience.
and see you next time. Bye.